Good morning, Philadelphia, and everywhere else via the live stream. This is Kevin O'Brien. I'm with Wayne Middleton. Dan's working hard behind the glass. This is the SMB Acceleration Show. Before we get into today's show, remember, if you miss anything this morning on a radio broadcast or live stream, you can catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are found or on our website, smbacceleration.com. Today's show is going to be a focus, again, on blogging. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into creating images for your blog and also how to promote those blogs so that you get the best value for your money. Wayne, you got to ask, how was the trip down on this holiday Monday? A uh, little slippy at the Allentown end. We just had uh, probably about two inches of snow. It was a little disappointing, to be honest. I was expecting a lot more. Um, so, yeah, it was a good drive down. Uh, the usual brain surgeons on the road that have to get somewhere a little bit quicker than everyone else. Uh, but beyond that, it was fun. And then I, the classic happened. I get off of uh, 476, and I'm just up onto, onto the Schuylkill, and I get stuck behind the guy who does not want to go above the speed limit. <laughs> In fact, he was going at least uh. 10 miles below the speed limit. And, oh, uh, excellent. He was going so slow, I couldn't get past him. Oh. So I was just stuck there the whole journey. But it was fine. I mean, you know, I, I always drive safely anyway, so I appreciated it. He could have just put his foot on the gas just a little bit more. Oh, is there a lot of traffic out there in general, though? Uh, it seems actually, like any difference for the holiday? Actually, yeah. I mean, surprisingly, not as busy as usual. Um, you know, typically, I can expect to hit uh, the school corner and take about 20 to 25 minutes to get from. Yeah. Uh, the 476 exit down to City Ave, where the radio shows, uh, where we broadcast from every Monday. Um, but yeah, this morning was pretty clear. Nice. I guess a lot of people are off for the holiday. I guess so. Those lucky, those lucky few. Huh? Yeah, call, I was going to say, call me jealous. Yeah. Well, my kids are probably doing the same as yours. Going to watch a movie. Oh yeah. Uh, we spent the weekend watching two, of, uh, one and two of Harry Potter because they just started getting into oh, Harry oh, Potter excellent. books. And so they've watched it four times now, and I'm sure they're going to put it on again. <laughs> Excellent. I have to say, you know what? I have never seen a Harry Potter. Uh, Any of them. They're clever. They've got some good effects, but, you yeah. know, it is what it is. No, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, my kids were watching uh, Togo for the second or third time again this okay. morning. Yeah, my, my guys haven't watched that, so. They, they, uh, they now go around calling our dog Togo. Oh, of nice. His name, Edison. So he, uh, <laughs> he now goes by Togo pretty much all the time. They, okay. They think yeah. you should. Uh, they wanted to know over the weekend if he could pull them on their sleds. I was like, I don't think this is going to be. Yeah. We're going to need more snow in case when you fall off. More snow, <laughs> possibly a team of 10. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't think he wants it. I think he likes the snow. I think he likes to be outside. He's not looking to. Yeah. Mush. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to mush anywhere. <laughs> uh, I don't blame him. Uh, but you know, it was a nice little bit of snow. It was. It was. Yeah, it was. It was enough that it was fun, and uh, you know, not too much that it was a, a hassle. I didn't even have to break out the snowblower. I just hand shoveled this weekend. Nice. So you know, it's good when it's there. Have you had to break out the snowblower yet? Uh, only to look at it <laughs> and make sure the batteries were working. So, like, <laughs> We never bought a gas-powered one. Um, okay. We wanted to sort of be somewhat kind to the environment, I guess, and so we we ended up buying a, a battery one. No way. There, which is actually surprisingly powerful. Oh, is a as it, long as you quick. keep it charged and don't do what I did when we had the big snow last year, where I went out and I was sort of doing it for like ten minutes and all of a sudden it just conked out. Really? So <laughs> I literally had a really nice uh, amongst the six inches of snow we had. I had a nice one lane of great clearance and everything else was still chopped, uh, and it took something like four or five hours to charge. Uh, so, and as the snow's falling more, you're like, come on, it's <laughs> just getting deeper. So in the end, you, it gets to a point where it's either going to be too deep that you can't use it, or you know. You just try to do what I did, which is put, it's got two battery cells. You put one battery cell on to charge, one in it. You go as long as that battery just lasts and keep switching it over. It's, it's, they, it's a very powerful machine. I'm glad we have it. Um, but I must admit, just you know, filling up the gas and going is a little easier. <laughs> yeah, combustion engines make it. Uh, yeah, know. they do make it easier. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, you got to be kind to the environment. You know, that actually uh, kind of segues excellent into the small business news and that. Uh, which actually caught my attention. It made me laugh. There's nothing better than, you know, uh, 
people taking advantage of, I guess, being aesthetically pleasing, you know? Yeah, I mean... In yeah. some ways. Yes. You know, like the uh, lady raising money for Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, but, I mean, apparently this guy has a legitimate business, and they, he goes by the hot milk man in North Jersey and New York City. And it's kind of genius, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Unfortunately, we're all a little bit uh, inclined to appreciate the finer things in life, and so he's just <laughs> taking full advantage of it. He delivers his goods, but yeah, he's doing it all on his own. Uh, it's actually featured in uh, the Guardian, right? Yeah, it is um, in the Guardian. Yeah, absolutely. Really interesting little story. Uh, it's worth looking at, and it just shows goes to show you business ideas can come from anywhere. And I think this one is actually pretty genius. Yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, the interesting thing was that the article highlighted you know even more than like him it highlighted how much effort he had to put into making the business work regardless of like how you look yeah it, it doesn't it's not easy and, no and I think that's you know, it's, as I said it's a good story it's got a great little background to it and if you are thinking about starting a, a small business not necessarily for a hot milkman um, but for some other in enterprise um, it's worth reading because he does go into detail about you know the challenges he's faced and how how and it gives you a really good indication as to how difficult it is really. To I was gonna start. say it sounds like the guy works pretty darn hard. He does, yeah. <laughs> so pumping a, a, all that milk cannot be easy. It cannot. No, I mean, geez, I remember growing up and seeing milkmen uh, turn up at our door, and they were not necessarily aesthetically pleasing, <laughs> but it was hard work. They were up at the crack of dawn or just before, and they're out there bringing their wares to the door, and you know, yeah. I'll tell you, you know, it's it's having a. Uh, similar conversation I was actually talking to my wife about this article like jokingly and I said you know what on the flip side as much as I like it I feel like too many people will condemn the uh, Instagram models of the world mm -hmm. I think people fail and myself at times fail to realize how much effort actually goes into that I mean that's like a probably a 60 70 80 hour a week job yeah being a someone who curates an Instagram feed for their personal brand yeah I mean building it, your personal brand and then maintaining it mm -hmm. it's hard hard work I mean I, I think about mine you know we've talked yeah. talked about my little side project where uh, I, I do my Instagramming about bass fishing or fishing in general and I will tell you it, it can really consume a lot of your time it takes a lot of dedication to keep those posts going frequently and uh, yeah it's it's a lot harder than people think to, to maintain a brand of any kind especially when it comes down to your personal brand it really you know it is and uh, interestingly my uh, wife is talking to a friend who has built an Instagram brand actually in the Lehigh Valley okay yeah and uh, it's all around food I think it's Lehigh Valley food for thought if uh, I'm wrong I, maybe you know, somebody will correct me but uh it's basically, you know, and she was explaining to my wife how she might have to take 60 pictures to get one, and then you have to put it through photo, you know, enhance it or yeah. edit it and crop it, uh, you know, and all of a sudden it becomes like you just said, even for it's trying all, to grow a small personal brand, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's almost like a full-time job in itself. Um, yeah, it doesn't pay well to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, you know, we, we I think it's, it's great that people are out there creating content it's always good to see content being produced especially good content just understand that it does take time so when these people are really invested in trying to grow their personal brand become a food writer or food photographer they take time and you know the irony is you can do a lot of it really with your cell phone and I know yeah. we may touch on a couple of things later on which may help you when you're putting together your, your personal brands or thinking about doing Instagram marketing uh, for your small business um, but it's again it's uh, it's time consuming yeah and there's, I mean honestly there is no simple business no you know people too often I feel are sold these false bill of goods from people like just open a Shopify store and you know what you'll be a t-shirt millionaire or just yeah. you know become an Instagram person you know Instagram influencer and you can make this or a YouTube influencer and you know, it's important to realize how much effort it's going to take. It's starting your own business, basically. But you know, that's the only way to look at it. I think um, I've, there's a, a guy that I've I followed for years, and um, it's called Brad Hussey. Uh, okay. 
he's a freelance web designer, uh, marketer generally, and he, he's built, um, he's been doing this for a number of years at this point. But I, one of the things that's always stuck in my head when I'm thinking about trying to grow my own marketing business mm-hmm. or design or whatever it is, is it, it really, it, it takes everything you've got and more to really make it work. And nothing comes easy. No. And, and you know, you, you can be sold a bill of goods about these Shopify stores or other small business kind of ideas that are out there. Um, and it's, you know, there's no quick way to making a business work or succeed and being successful with it. So, you know, dedication, hard work, be, being up all sorts of hours. I know you know how that feels. Um, working sometimes throughout the night. Um, yeah. It, it, this is what it takes to, to run and start to build your business. And eventually, you know, if you're good at it and things start to take off, it becomes easier. But it's all, you've always got that nagging doubt over your head about this or about that. Um, so it's a brave person that takes on growing a small business. And I think it's worth taking a second and just appreciating all those people that do it because it is, it is incredibly difficult. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even if those folks that are doing it, especially, you know, because they have a full-time job and have that secondary, you know, passion that they're trying to build, you know, it's a day like today. Say you're off, all of a sudden you're not off because you're putting time into this secondary, uh, you know, business that you're looking to grow. Yes, yeah. you know, it it's like a never, everything. It does, yeah, it like, does. you're right. But you know, but it always the uh, rewards are worth it, I think. Um, you get that, you know, you think about the pros and cons of everything. The rewards can be really, really worthwhile in terms of getting that life balance that we're all searching for. And I think everyone's looking for that. Having that extra income mm-hmm. always helps especially when you've got a, a small family that you're thinking about the future for um so you know with hard work comes high rewards it's worth trying you know it isn't i would never say don't try it it's definitely worth trying at least once in your absolutely life, i think yes and then you know what it always makes you think of that uh mark cuban quote where he said you know it doesn't matter how many times you fail you only have to be right once and then tell everyone you're an overnight success yeah you know and he was kind of like kind of going off the cuff to people who'd asked him like well you know people say that you're like an overnight success and he was like you know people don't realize how hard I work you know that he owned a bar and owned small businesses that he failed at before you know mm-hmm. selling broadcast.com or even what was that that micro solutions or whatever yeah. previous to that but like he failed a number of times right and people think of him as an overnight success they don't realize how many nights, weekends, days, like years, sleep, <laughs> yeah. years. Exactly. And, and, and yeah, I mean, it's true. And, and it actually leads into, you know, some of the concerns that you have as a small business, you know, is when you start in making employee, uh, creating jobs, opportunities for people, and then mm-hmm. you've got their livelihoods to think about. And there was actually a really good article that you pointed out on the usnews.com about the, um, 2020 is expecting to bring higher labor costs absolutely um, for small businesses so you know it it's really every, there's a lot of hurdles out a lot, of, a lot of potential obstacles to try to overcome and this is just another one in the many long list of, of different things that you're going to face as, as a small business yes yeah, I think hiring yeah. might, you know is absolutely one of the most difficult things people go through you know yeah hiring and knowing who to hire why you when to hire them when to kind of slow down on your hiring and it, you know to caveat that is uh, one of the hardest things i've ever had to do is, is unfortunately let people go yeah um because you do regardless of how good a business person you are you start to build relationships with people and um when it's in a small environment like a small business they they become extensions of your family because i mean you see them more than your family nine times out absolutely of and so when you have to make that call where yeah you know sorry it's, it's you know i can no longer keep you it, it's really tough it is not yeah no i've uh having known like the restaurants and all we had to go through it and you know what it never gets easier every time you're like ah oh. This is brutal. I mean, unless you're a terrible employee, honestly, then I'm like, all right, if you got to go, you got to, yeah. Yeah, if you're not, <laughs> if they, if, uh, I always reminded my father in law tell me a story. He had difficulty, uh, uh, he, he ran a team, um, but he had some challenges um, with some of his staff members. One of them uh, kept falling asleep at his desk, but he was the hardest one to get rid of. And I was like, why? You've got perfect. Yeah, Ra- grounds for it. He's not putting his weight. He's not putting the work in, and he's falling asleep at his desk. He said, "Yeah, but 
you know, the question then comes back to you as the manager is why are you not motivating him? And I was like, uh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> so it, it's very interesting. And, you know, when you, when you let those people go, some are very easy, some are just not. Oh, uh, some you're like, I hope they don't come back in here later. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Oh, um, the other kind of thing was kind of interesting that we read this weekend um, was about business and social media. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, you know, there's certainly no question that social media is huge in, in um, is huge for small businesses and growing your networks, trying to build communities and to, to you know, to another extent, growing your brand. Um and it was just some interesting data points that came out of that came out of the article, I think. Um, so, 2018, uh, there was a report done uh, by Score that more than three quarters, or 77 percent, of small businesses use social media to support their core processes, including marketing, customer service, and sales. Yeah. So it shows you how diverse social media can be, right? So we've talked a lot, yeah. ad nauseum to some level, about social media and what it can do. But you start thinking about it as a customer services platform, you know, and you can start, you know, using Twitter to respond. I'm always reminded of that famous uh, Comcast story where single employee at Comcast, <clears throat> their Twitter account was blown up with some complaints and he took it upon himself to respond. And now that, that's literally created Comcast kind of customer service. They now have a team of people really? dedicated to Twitter huh. to respond to negative cut quotes and try to help people find a solution to their issues. But it all started with one guy just taking that little extra initiative on Twitter to respond to someone. So I think it's a great medium. I think that Twitter's an excellent medium for responding to people. I think it is because, you know, I. I mean, I've done it myself. You buy a product and it goes for me. And what you do is you put a picture of the product out there and say, yeah, I was really enjoyed, really looking forward to getting this. And then eh, it didn't work where I wanted it to. And, you know, what surprises me is by, uh, or what surprised me at the time is that I didn't get a response from the company who made the product. Mm. I'm not going to mention any names. I didn't get a response. But what I did get a response from was the company who sold it to me, which was Amazon. Okay. Amazon responded. Not only did they, uh, you know, not only did they uh, comfort me about the problem with the the product, um, they also said, "Would you like us to send you a new one, or is there an alternative product that you would like to consider?" Um, so I said, hey, well, "You know, let's let's try a new one and send it through. Maybe it was just full yeah. at the time." Um, and they sent me it through free of charge. So how did did Amazon respond via email or via via Twitter? No way. Yeah. So you tagged Amazon in addition to the product manufacturer. Yep. And, and Amazon. So, and I got a response within uh, within 24 hours. Really? Which was amazing. Um, so it did. It went that extra level to making me feel more comfortable. Not necessarily with the manufacturer of the brand, but definitely with Amazon. So therefore, you know, I, Amazon, kudos, you, you did a great job. Um, and you didn't... I didn't come away feeling that I'd been ripped off in any way, shape, or form, and got got the product. And and ironically, when the product arrived um, after being replaced, it was a faulty product, no which kidding. made me feel much better about getting the, it. For the first original place. purchase, so, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, I think we often underestimate that everything Amazon does is about the customer, and that's really, you know, I once heard Warren Buffett say this person he would least like to go against in business right now would be Jeff Bezos and mm -hmm. his rationale was he took something that became was so mundane for most of us and he completely re-engineered the experience and now it's enjoyable he was like buying groceries or you know going to the convenience store or not convenience store but like you know the, the retails like go uh, you know going Walmart to the mall for instance, the, yeah and, exactly and then trying mall. to go to yeah a Walmart or you're going to go to Target or something yeah yeah, and and it did. It changed, <clears throat> changed the way we shop. There's no doubt about it. I would also say, what it has also done for those uh, big box stores, is made them up their game. Oh, absolutely, he hugely. Took yes. Um, so you know now, and we talked about this. I think it was last week or the week before, where we were talking about creating an in-store experience. Yeah. So you know, even a Walmart did it, having the greeter at the front door. Even having a little touch like that where someone at the door welcoming you into the store, asking if you need any help finding mm -hmm. anything, 
this is all lessons they've learned from the e-commerce business that is Amazon. Uh, and so it's it's really interesting just how not the only yeah. not only influence that Amazon had on everything or Bezos, sorry, yeah. had on everything, but also how you know box stores have reacted to it. And not only is their online presence much much better, they've got to compete on the delivery of these products, the shipping and everything else. Um, but also the in-store experience is so much more improved than what it used to be. Yes, it is. It really, you know, even the uh, picking up of, you know, the your online orders from location has become easier. They now have the lockers and all as like a response yep. to Amazon because people want that frictionless customer experience. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I noticed in my local Target, we've got online shoppers parking spots now. So really? basically... You don't even have to get out of the car. The people in Target, if your order's there, you let them know you're coming. They will bring out what you ordered uh, to your car, put it in your car, and off you go. Wow. Yeah, pretty crazy. Wegmans does the same. I think Wegmans does a similar I've, sort of thing. I've always wanted to do the grocery shop in my mind. I've never had. I've, we did it. I think we did it once when I lived back in the UK. It's been in the UK for a while. Okay. Um, and I, I can't remember which store it was. But we ordered it, and because there wasn't something that we had on our list, they replaced it with something else. Okay. And I must admit, it was the replacing it with something else that I didn't like, because that's not what we wanted. Yeah. So I would rather, I would have rather them say, hey, this was not available, but yeah. as soon as it is, we'll send it out to you. That would have been better than getting the experience of having something that was like, eh, that's not what we really wanted. And yeah. it's not really part of the the, the meal structure we was gonna build in or whatever. <laughs> That would have made the experience better. And I think it has moved along since oh, yeah. those days. That but, would make sense. But that that one time experience has put us off doing it. For I can a, understand. Yeah, almost yeah. forever at this point. Yeah, you're like, so, I don't know about that. Yeah, uh, it's like grocery mm. delivery, right? Um, um, I mean, getting back to the social media, another interesting data point that came out of this same report, and you can check out the report on azbigmedia.com. Um, the report found that 69% of adults in the US use at least one social media network. That's a huge, number. huge number, huge number, at least one. So, you know, I myself use multiple. I know you yeah. use multiple. Um, so it gives you a real idea. If you're trying to find your audience and reach them, you could do worse than trying through social media. And if you're not doing social media right now, where have you been? Get on it now and start thinking about a decent strategy to work it. I thought the interesting thing, just in like, though it's not an apples to apples comparison, is seems more businesses have social media than have websites because that other research said what 46 percent of businesses have a website or yeah it was it was a low, it was actually quite a low number yeah, yeah um, surprisingly low yeah and it even that kind of raises questions which is if you don't have a business oh uh, well, sorry if you have a business but don't have a website how are you converting them how are you getting new customers? How are you converting customers? Is it just through your social media channels? Are you leveraging form extensions on there yeah. or something? It, it just opens up a whole new kind of approach to, to marketing, I think, and building your small business. Oh, it sure does, right? I mean, it, the options out there, it goes to show you there's a lot of businesses that are running without finding value and trying to run without a website, but just via social media. And the reason why most people run without a website. What do you think? What do you think? I think it's the difficulty in starting it. I think it's difficulty in starting it, but I would say it's cost. Really? I, I, that's what I think. I think there is a, for many years, websites have been sold at quite high numbers. Me and you were discussing this yeah. just, actually just before the show. Um, but websites, you know, if you go to a company who claim to build websites, um, there's a number of them out there, and you, you say, okay, I need a website, it needs to do this, it needs to do this, it needs to do this, and then all of a sudden you get you know, almost like a $100,000 figure on the end of it. I'm not going to pay for that. Or even $20,000. Even 20000 feels too much. I mean, realistically, when we talked about this in later sh uh, earlier shows, um, if you get onto a Wix or you get onto a Squarespace or something like that, you can actually build a website yourself very easily. It may not be the all singing, all dancing, but it's enough of a, a presence to have a store. Better than nothing. And it's cheaper. Right? Yeah. So you could probably do that for what, two, three, maybe $400 at the top. 
if you want something a little bit more advanced than that and you're trying to do some lead generation or, or things like yeah, that, you may want a couple of thousand. Five, so, yeah. I mean, it, you know, time, money, and then fear of not knowing how to do it. I was going to say, yeah, and I think for a lot of people, it's also, I, I, what I often hear is they don't know what to write to start the first. Like, you know, it's uh, one of those things, you know, they say about like being an author, you just have to start writing every day yeah and same as blogs and, yeah. and this is why we like last week we talked about blogs yeah. quite a bit and we're getting into more detail this week um the fear of building content i'm not a writer and i said this last week i'll, mm. I'll take a claim on it every day um i am not a writer but you don't always need to write what you can do is with a simple website is explain your services i mean if you don't know what you're selling there's a bigger problem yeah. at hand but like listing out your services the times you're open and where you can be, fi- be found that's minimally all you would need to do for your website you don't need this about us and mission statement and everything else if you're not comfortable doing it what you can do is work with someone um, over time to build that who has more experience with writing yeah. that's another way of doing it so, or yeah or you know, take anything you have if you have partners that you you know have PDFs or you know one pagers, just Flyers, kind of re- yeah. Yeah, recycle anything you've ever made and make it into your initial website, and then just you know kind of take that little bit of task of it every day of improvement. Maybe write three sentences, four sentences, you know, add an image. But the more you write, the better you get. Yeah, that's it's true. It's a tough thing, but you know, that can definitely be done. And uh, as you and I definitely think, there's a lot of value. There's obviously a lot of value in creating a website because there's a lot of businesses who obviously don't have it that are missing out on the whole organic side of traffic. Yeah, not only that, I mean, they're limiting to, to some level the amount of time their stores or their services are able to be accessed. Yeah. A website is your shop front. It's All the time. 24-7, 365. Um, you know, that's the most important thing about it is constantly there when you cannot always be there. Um, yeah. So, I mean... It, it just basically that if you if you're not on if you're not online 24 7 365 nowadays you're probably not going to be uh, considered very often no and i agree i think that you know what it makes me think of one of the i can't remember who it was somebody had invested in one of the casinos in atlantic city once said you know what you know why i invested in it it's open 24 hours a day 365 days a year you know they're always kind of have the opportunity to be making money and if you have a small business website you have that opportunity. Yeah. Like, I might be searching for your product. I might work over at, you know, third shift, second shift, and be searching for your product at not normal times. I can put through a contact form and then start that conversation on a time that's good for me without me trying to have to schedule a call when I might not be available. Yeah, and I would say if, if cost of a website is, is holding you back, why not consider how much one customer would be? Yes. How much could how much how much revenue would you make off of that one customer coming in through a website um, versus putting all these leaflets out there that may or may not produce a customer at the end of it? Website isn't guaranteed to drive yeah. customers, but you have more of an opportunity to get them, and they're not instantly thrown into the trash like a lot of your direct mail or your pro, your promos that you leave around. So, you know, again, your website can be a massive tool to your business. And if you haven't got one, I'd be really interested to hear from people that don't have one. Uh, just so we can hear how you're, how else you're leveraging maybe technology or something else to, to help promote and build your business. But um, yeah, send us an email, info at smbacceleration.com if you run a business without a website. We'd love to talk to you, even bring you on the air and uh, kind of talk it through how you are generating business. Yeah, and, and then we can even help... Uh, help kind of allay some of those fears about what a website is and how much it will be. Absolutely, so we're gonna take a quick break and before we do, just remember, if you missed anything this morning, the radio broadcast or live stream, you can catch the podcast on our website, smbacceleration.com or anywhere podcasts are found. And we come back, we're gonna talk small business blogging. (laughs) We all got a little sidetracked on that one, didn't we? Uh, Live stream, if you have any questions, send them in. Oh, I see. So we we got shore points. Oh, is it? No, I, was, I can do it on the way back. So we're going to get into the promoting, right? Uh, yep. Promoting. Well, no. Images first. Images first. It's going to be heavy on you. Yep. It's interesting. Should I use typing in my posts? 
there's no yes or no answer to that. It's, mm. it's, it depends on what you're doing. I think you need a mix of them. There you go. So you're actually on um, thingy now, live stream now, seeing how many people are on. I don't have it up. I can bring it up. Live stream, if you're out there watching, let us know. <laughs> it's good to talk. It's good to know you're out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't tell. I can't see LinkedIn now. So if you're on LinkedIn, give us a shout. Do me a favor, just turn my head for, headset up a little. You go. All right, we're back, and we're about to get into a topic that I personally often struggle with, and I think it's extremely valuable because, as they say, you know, a picture. Is worth a thousand words and uh, as Wendy Sausman brought up a couple weeks ago you know video can convey a lot of uh, words but yeah, I think you need those blog images and social media images to really convey your brand and you know one good image might be worth 10,000 words it could you could summarize your entire blog article business whatever it is in one picture yeah which is pretty powerful and so, I mean, we're here today and we're going to talk about some of these things and, you know, um, I spend, I mean, I'm traditionally a graphic designer, so I, I, I more than anyone else know how to leverage images and, and what makes a good image and what doesn't. And there are a bunch of tools out there nowadays uh, that can help you um, create great visuals and you just got to have a bit of an eye. You got to know what you're looking for and what, what may or may not resonate. And uh, I know like leading into this some of the things we're going to get into is okay what makes a good image uh, should I use should I or should I not use text in my uh, social media posts uh, or in my LinkedIn profile or whatever um, you know how do I differentiate myself there's a lot of free stock images out there but they all start to look very similar and you don't necessarily always want to have an image on your associated to your brand that may be somewhere else in the in the atmosphere, you know, yeah, a different absolutely. brand. So how do you differentiate it, and, and how do you select a picture that's kind of unique to you? My first instinct, honestly, is always to try to get your own photography if you can. Okay. Um, make you know, do it yourself to some level, or get a photographer to, especially if you're doing business promotions. Um, nothing better than showing your store, uh, your, whatever it is, whether it's a product or a service or a store. And, whatever the business type application is, it's always good to get a shot that you own because then no one else can have that and that's unique to you. If Do you, you think you could take those shots with today's cell phones? You can for certain applications. Um, right. I wouldn't necessarily say you can use them uh, in print. They're not going to no, have high enough resolution yeah. for that. But for web applications, That's what I was thinking. Uh, social media posts, yeah, absolutely, you can use your phone. You just got to understand what makes a good photo or how to frame a good photo. Well, there, that's, see, that's so, tricky because I, I don't know if we have ever mentioned, supposedly, according to my wife, take absolutely the worst photos ever. I've seen them, I can concur. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it's uh, very easily I could show you, in, and I'm going to talk it rather than show people on, on the show, but... Uh, there's a rule of thirds, right? So you, what you do is you break up your screen into thirds. There's a, there's actually, if you go into the preferences on most phones, there's a grid that actually breaks it up for you. Okay. Whatever your focal point is. So if I was taking a picture of Kevin at the microphone right now, he would be in my left hand third to show the 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 studio space as well as Kevin. I don't want him to be center focus because then it's a bit weird. If I put him off to the side, he's going to make a nicer shot. Where the magic happens is really in the editing after that. It's like how you soften the light, how you do, you know, how you change the tone of the image and things like that. But to get a, a good shot, think about your thirds. If you want room for typography, create room with typography. Typography. So I would take a picture of Kevin right now, and I would 
have the rest of the studio space open to the right hand side, that creates my opportunity to use text. If I wanted him to be more of the main focal point of the entire frame, he would be more centered. He wouldn't be true center because that just has a really weird balance. Yeah. I'd have him just slightly either left or right of center. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to make way <laughs> demonstrate for the live stream. And then so, we'll put it up on the uh, website later so everyone can see what he's talking about. Because I would have put you right in the middle. So here's. I would have had you dead center. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see, this is. Uh, so here. You can't see this. I'm going to put him in the left hand side. Uh huh. And I'm going to do one where he's just slightly off center. And then I'm going to do one that, where he's sitting to the far right. And you'll be able to look just at that. Same. He's in the yeah. same position, three different poses. But each one has a slightly different feel to it. Even down to the elevation, if I'm looking down on him, you never want to do an up nostril shot because that's always, you know, that's fair. I think that's one of my uh, terrible, my wife was like, why are you always bending, down, kneeling down when you're taking pictures? You do it. And yeah. I'm like, well, I don't know. But I think, personally, I think I take good pictures of trees and nature, but. Well, that's where the downward focus would work. So if, <laughs> if you're into doing, if you're, if you're doing landscape shooting, it's a very different animal. And it all depends on the subject that you're yeah. trying to shoot. So. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of uh, fishing photography, and some of it is not so much like the guy holding the fish. Although, you know, yeah. I've done this myself. People, if you catch a small one, but you want to make out it's bigger than it is, just move it closer to the lens. It's it's easy. It <laughs> looks huge, um, but you know, to a trained eye, I can see the difference. But in if you're taking photos of an office space, having that downward angle mm -hmm. looking up makes it feel bigger. It opens up the space and and shows. It gives you more to look at, so it, it creates this illusion of having more space around you and that your office is probably bigger than what it is, which is why in real estate, they always choose the top angle or the bottom angle to look out over, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> subject matter, so if you're shooting a product or something like that, you don't really want, uh, unless you're doing lifestyle photography where you're setting up a scene and your product's part of that scene, obviously whatever's in the scene can't be more prominent than your product. So you always mm. want to make sure that's front and center in a prominent position and everything else you can subdue back a little bit by adjusting your focus. So with a, a subject matter of Kevin, <laughs> and I don't want to go upwards because I'm going to get a lot of nostril. I want to kind of have him face on or slightly elevated, almost like a selfie shot um, where he's he's fit, looking natural, but it's, it's coming at an angle that, that people can rely on is where his eyes are focused and how he's looking at me. That would be the interesting point. Um, I could do a whole show just on photography because there's so much involved. Oh, no, there Good is. basics of thirds, rule of thirds. So yeah. I guess really the thing is, uh, especially <laughs> if you're going to be using your either cell phone or like a DSLR, is take a lot of pictures. Yeah. Uh, it, normally, to give you an idea, we did a photo shoot recently mm -hmm. uh, for a client of ours. Um, I was art directing and we had a photographer do it and I think she took over 600 photos wow and out of those 600 photos we're probably only going to use 10 wow <coughs> the reason you do that is because you have a variety of different shots and slightly adjusted angles and yeah. slightly different focuses and really what you want to do is out of all those is cull it down and you slowly start to get to the selective view. You never throw the rest of those images away because you can use them in other applications. But for the ones that you want on your website or you know, you're going to use through social media, you, you select the best of what you got. So the more images you take, the better it is. Yeah. <clears throat> I've yet to find a photographer that gets one shot and it's done. You know, yeah. it, it I would if someone did that to me, I'd be like no, you're going to be taking more photos now because that's not the shot. And yeah. Yeah, I want to see a variety. Um, yeah, because you never know what you're going to get, especially because it's basically free. You know, a shot <coughs> exactly. costs no money. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it doesn't... You're paying for that person's time. You're not paying for how many photos they take. So you want as many photos you can possibly get. Um, It's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. 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 That's, all right. Fair enough. <laughs> if you're self-developing, you limit. Thanks, Dan. Uh, if you if you limit your uh, if, if someone is doing it the old-fashioned way with film, which hey, I can still produce film now. I, I still know the whole procedure. Um, but most for the most part, most photographers nowadays are digital based. So. 
But if they were, that would always limit the cost and the amount of shots you do. With digital, you're, you're almost unlimited and you're only paying for that person's time. So make sure you get a lot of shots. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect kind of way is, well, all right, I'm going to use, say, 50 of my 600 because I tend to be cheap and I'm going to use a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the... So what is the next step? Like, I think a lot of people struggle here. They feel like they take good pictures. You know, it's almost even like the... Instagram filters now, you know, they make uh, everybody feel better. But if you're a small business, how do you go about improving the images you're taking? What if you're really, say you're really a, uh, you know, disciplined small business owner and every day you're taking a picture of something in the town, whether it's whatever it is, you know, it's a local business, you're following our blog and tips and you're like, I'm out there creating all this content now. How do I make my images better? And I think that's a tough thing for a lot of people. Yeah, and uh, again, with the Instagram filters, um, I tend not to use them, honestly. They're overused. Um, They're overused. All they're really doing is doing slight color adjustments. So you can, there's a a number of different apps out there that you can use uh, to do it. Snapseed is one, which is a free one. That's a, a Google powered. Okay. And it gives you a lot more control. You can control the temperature of the, the shot. Um, so basically what that does is add a blue or a red reddish filter it creates cold or warm you can adjust the color balance you can adjust the brightness um, you know you can see these highly stylized which they call HDR images which adds this kind of grain to it so it mm. doesn't feel like a, a real shot so minimally what I would look to do is improve the sharpness adjust the brightness uh, a little bit and then just think about do I, do I want to carry across this warm, slightly warmer feel? So I start to add a little bit of a yellow or a red to, filter to it so it becomes warmer. Um, but honestly, the best thing to do is crispness. Um, you okay. know, there's, there's a bunch out there, as I said, Snapseed is one, and I use that myself, and I really enjoy that one. Okay. There's o- Adobe Photoshop Fix. There's Lightroom, uh, which is also another Adobe product. Is that there's Lightroom Mobile, or is it? It is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and with with Lightroom, really, what you want to do is take your photographs through Lightroom. What does that? What do you mean by that? So you can turn on your camera, and Apple has its own little uh, app that enables you to take the photo. Well, with Adobe Lightroom, you can actually take the photo within Lightroom, which gives you a lot more control over the the settings of that photo. So you can adjust your brightness, your contrast, your tone. Uh, you can tweak it so that you can change the focal point. So if the focal point on a face is the eye and you want that to be the strongest part of it and the crispest part of it, you can almost diffuse the rest of the shot so it focuses on... on like portrait quantity. mode on the Apple. Exactly. Apple. Okay. Um, it's it's a bit more for your more advanced user, I would say, but a minimum, Christmas. Make sure it's nice and sharp. Uh, make sure you you kind of warm it up a little bit here and there, and the the brightness and contrast. That way you'll get richer colours. Uh, you'll be able to adjust the kind of saturation of the image as well, um, and then ultimately make a stronger, more visually appealing. Image. Okay, so walk me through because since we were talking, you were mentioning your. Uh, fishing Instagram. Yes. So you were out enjoying the rest of the holiday after the show and were able to go fishing. Maybe it's ice fishing, whatever it is. Uh, and today, uh, today it would be ice yeah. fishing folks. Um, uh, and w- walk me through, you just caught, you know, something that you t- photo worthy. What's your process? When, are you going to use Snapseed or are you using Adobe? What's the, your process right now for getting that image and then getting it up on, or enhancing the image and getting it up on social media. So the way I would do today, um, and I've done this a few times, is I I want to tell a visual story. Okay. I'm useless at words, so I want to make a visual story. So first off, I would take some shots of where I'm fishing. Okay. And maybe it's close-ups of the rocks or the water or or something, something really picturesque that I'm, I'm focusing on. When I catch that fish, it's really hard to hold a camera, hold a fish, and try to take a shot yourself with the fish. If you have someone with you, have them do it. If you don't, then take yourself out of the equation and just focus on the fish. At the end of the day, the people on my Instagram are not there to see my ugly mouth. They want to see what I've caught. So what I try to do is, um, I'm not always handling the fish. I will put it in the net. I will set up a little, just a very quick little setup 
I'll have my fishing rod to one side, I'll have the fish in the net, and I'll take a couple of shots at different angles just to get different perspectives of what the fish looks like. Then I will ship nine times out of ten, I will show a release shot, which is the only time where I really hold a fish to support it. Okay. So I'll have my hand in the water, the fish will be sitting on top, and I'll take a shot as it goes away. Okay. And it just creates this visual story that I put together. I will then go in after I've been fishing, because I, I never do it on the bank, it takes too long. Yeah. Um, afterwards, I will look at the shots I took, and I'll take three or four of each of these. Okay, so you have four of the location, four of the fish in some form of like captured state, yeah. and then four in a release state, four exactly. or five, whatever, you know, somewhere Yeah, there. somewhere okay. around there, some sort of logic to that. Yeah. I will then look at the, those images when I get home, I will pick what I feel are the best ones, and really that's it, that's just gut instinct what what looks best yeah um and then i'll look at it and assess do i need to adjust it because okay. sometimes you don't sometimes you just get the best and yeah. and it's it's you know sometimes the light's just right it feels right and looks good so you don't need to always adjust things mm -hmm. and even so looking at it, i'll figure out if i'm going to adjust it nine times out of ten if i'm going to adjust anything it's going to be the sharpness and the contrast okay nine times out of ten I'll, I'll make some quick adjustments so it becomes richer, full of full of color. Pick the th four best ones and then just do it as a sequence of shots. Post it up on Instagram. Like a four done. sequence, one post. Yeah, I will nine times out of ten also put my logo on it somewhere. Okay, so walk me through. Are you using Snapseed or Lightroom to Snapseed, Lightroom? Um, what is, what most of the time I use right Snapseed. Now? Really? Most, yeah, it's just faster. easier and faster. Okay. Um, and it's it really is very simple, folks. You load the image in, you adjust it with your thumb in terms of brightness, and you can see it. You take it to extreme, and you see how bad it is, and then you take it to the other extreme and see how bad it is there, and then you find somewhere in the middle. Nice medium, right. okay. Um, so it's really quick. It's really easy. There's a bunch of good, good presets on it, too. So you, unlike the Instagram ones, which are okay, there's a bunch of presets that you can do, that, and there's over 50 of them. In Snapseed, I think, and those presets are set up to do exactly what we're talking about: adjust the tone, the contrast, the sharpness of the image, mm -hmm. add some warmth or depth or whatever. So you can actually just flick through the presets if you want to. If you want to get into more of the kind of stylizing stuff, then you play around with the additional filters. So a lot, there's a lot of trial and trial and error to start with. Now, the interesting thing is when you find something that works, you can save it as a preset. So when I next go fishing and do kind of a similar sequence, I can try my filter that I created first oh, time and okay. see if that works. Yeah. That helps in so many ways. It helps a consistent look and feel to your photography that you're going to use for your Instagram posts mm -hmm. or your Facebook or whatever. Um, and that consistency of shot is really important. If your shots all kind of look and have that same feel to them, not necessarily the same topic or the same subject, but the same feel, they, they look cohesive. Um, it's almost like it becomes your social your media feed becomes like a gal, like a yeah. uh, magazine. Almost. Exactly. Um, so then you you know you work on it from there. And actually, you, it's funny you bring up magazines. If you want to look at good photography, magazines spend millions of dollars on getting photographers to do the shoots. Yeah. And if you look at them, the light, everything else, they 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 adjust it similar to what I'm saying to do here for your social posts. Um, but if you look at it, you can actually start to see the third grid come into play. All photographers use it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just understand that that one shot they got in that magazine was part of a thousand shot, a thousand photo shoot. You know? Yeah, all day. So it all took day, multiple 24 days. Hours. Yeah. Yeah. So it really is. It's just a matter of looking. It could be just the right look, the right kind of focal point that you're trying to achieve. No, that's a great point. And how about getting a logo on how do you go about that? Because um, it seems like that would be give people a struggle. Yeah, the logo can be a struggle because there, you know, again, it all depends on what you're going to use in terms of your app. I'm just getting my phone up so I can actually remember the name of the software that I use. Uh, the one that I use most is called Adobe Photoshop Mix. Okay. So it enables you to access your um, images on your phone. Okay. So you access them, you select the one you want, and then you can create layers. And this is the key. If I want to put a logo on on an image, I'll I'll add it to a layer. Oh, okay. And then within Elements itself, you can choose to cut out the background of it. So if you take a if you take your logo and you put it in, it will come in with a white background or a black background. You want to take it out of that background. 
right? Yeah. So very easily you can just trace around your uh, uh, trace around the negative space around that logo. It will cut it out, and then you're left with a logo sitting on top of an image. So then what you can do is add shadows and stuff like that, so it lifts it off, or you can kind of adjust so it. So it almost looks density. like a watermark. Yeah. So I would I highly recommend Photoshop Elements. I, I've tried a few others, and honestly, I think this one is the best. Um, I believe it's free. I don't think you even need the Adobe account for this one. Oh, that's excellent. Um, it's quick. It's easy. You can do multiple layers, so you can also do your text layers in there if you wanted to do text. Um, so it so you really Snapseed it to edit it, and then do the like adding a logo and the layers, text or whatever you would do with yeah. Photoshop uh, and because, or Elements. Yeah, and because I do a lot of them, my idea is ease, right? So I don't want to spend hours and hours and hours because it sounds like it's going to take a lot of yeah. time. It really doesn't. I can get. What I've done in Photoshop Elements is created a blank template with just my logo. Oh, you just drop. And I can in. move my logo wherever I want because it's on its own yeah. floating layer. So then all I do is drop in the image, move the adjust the layers if it comes in on top of the logo, I'll move it behind the logo. Yeah. And then I can move the logo to where it sits best in the image. Perfect. So it, you can really you know templating is is the way forward when it comes to this because it enables you to move quicker so if you're a small business owner you know between snapseed and photoshop elements you kind of just walked it through a pretty simple uh repetitive process for yeah, photo editing. strong yeah. strong photo editing yeah and then post yeah okay uh yeah you can use all your uh, you can do your type in there and everything if you're gonna if you want to help and you're not, you're struggling to kind of come up with nice typographical uh, lockups yeah. is the word I would use. Um, you know, there, again, there's a, a number of apps out there. I just happen to use um, Spark Adobe Spark Post. Oh Post, yeah, which is uh, basically a bunch of different templates for social media posts. So when you see these posts that have really nice messages on it, maybe it's a quote from a a famous person yeah. it's got this nice image behind it that's probably done in in an, an app like Adobe Spark post um, it really is neat it's quick it's easy you, you can create your own template absolutely or you can use some of the predetermined templates okay. that they have you have complete control over it you can adjust the fonts uh, what font you want if you want something more cursive versus more traditional oh uh, I gotcha so there's a lot Spark you can do Spark post I have to check that and out. I think what I, actually, why don't we do this? Uh, on the website in the coming weeks, we'll put together a... I'll try to do a video tutorial of how to use these apps and show you some examples yeah. of what we've discussed on the show today that maybe you can use in your own social media applications. How about for the bit small business owners that don't feel comfortable doing it on their phone? Do you, is there, what do you like on the desktop? Adobe. Okay, what if you it's, can't it's, use Adobe? Are you, uh, how do you feel about, I always liked Canva and Get Stencil in my book are yeah. pretty interchangeable. Um, they obviously both have their own, you know, strong points and weaker yeah. sides, but I think both really, I mean, to the ease of doing it, if you're, you know, much more comfortable on your desktop, you just don't like doing it on your phone. I and mean, I think both of them are great options to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I'm fortunate enough that I have to use Adobe in what I do yeah. for my job, right? So, But there's such a learning that, curve. That it's a learning curve. It doesn't come cheap. So <laughs> my best recommendations, I love Canva personally. Okay. I've used that a lot. I think that has some great applications. Um, the Adobe Spark, which okay. is outside of the Adobe Suite, I, I can't remember if it's free or not, but they also have a web-based version. So it's oh, okay. not just an app. Oh. So you can still use that too. Okay. Um, but I would say... You know, again, a lot of these I've seen and, and done different things with, but I would say Canva for me is, is number one, and then I would probably look at Spark Post for okay. Adobe just to look at their web version. There are a, a bunch of others, and we'll have to put some links on. You know, um, yes, on I'll tell you, though, website. I agree. I, uh, the Get Stencil I had for... I haven't used that one. It was interesting. It, it's more made for social media images, I feel, than... Canva's really t kind of brought in and gone with like you know print and all. Yeah. But the big thing with the get stencil was kind of as the stencil you know naming. Their goal was like you could be like create 
and optimize the image across multiple platforms, kind of like with clicking buttons and yeah. a few minor adjustments. Which is, uh, and again, Spark Post does the same thing. And yeah. that actually saves a hell of a lot of time. Yes. Uh, so if you are running multiple channels and you want to use this image across all of them, this is a, a yeah. you know, those, those two tools are fantastic to do that. I think if you're doing more your print based stuff and or, or using some big hero shots on your yeah. website, you want to use um, yeah more of your photo editing kind of software, and that's where Canva comes in a little bit more. It does, and uh, you know, if, for those not familiar with Canva, you, you can use both. It offers you the option to purchase professional images, what for a dollar each, which yeah. is really nice. Low royalty free, or yeah. use your own images, or they have a selection of free images. Yeah. Um, that you don't pay for. Um, so you can use those. Adobe also offers Adobe Photos, which is the same thing. They're, they're fairly cost effective. You buy credits and Shutterstock, all these sort of big photo libraries, they do it. Um, the danger is there, you you know, you're, you have access to millions of photos, but so does everyone else. Correct, yeah. And that's not always a bad thing. If, if you can't get a shot of the, the subject matter you want, maybe it's a yoga pose, right? Mm -hmm. So we, I had this conversation with my wife the other day. Yoga poses um, have to be done a certain way, and people will look at the detail. Yeah. So if you find a stock photo that the yoga pose is slightly off, I would rather get a shot of someone getting it bang on. So yeah, I I pay that little bit more for it, or I'd get it done myself. Yeah. Um, the irony is, you can then, if the photo is good enough, you can then sell it back <laughs> to the stock libraries. <laughs> oh, once you retire, and start to get yeah. some some very low kind of reward mm -hmm. uh, income coming in from your photography efforts. So. No, that's excellent. This is really a great uh, discussion on photos. We're going to put up the photos of me on the website and Wayne's going to show kind of the difference in thirds. And you know what? That's about all the time we have for today. Next week, we're going to get into promoting your blog. So we've touched on creating content last week. This week was a focus really on the images for round blogs. Yep. And next week, we're going to talk how to get your blog out there, how to get it to generate new money. So for Kevin O'Brien. And for me, it's uh, from him and from me. It's, <laughs> it's been a great show, and we look forward to hearing from you all next week. Sounds good. See you. Uh, I, I couldn't hear the music at all. No. 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 Uh, Thank you, Ed. I hear. Uh, should we is that off? I hear.